Hey, 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 what's up, everybody? This is Rankable Live. I'm your host, Garrett Sussman of I Pull Rank. And I'm excited today because because talking to, to an old an old professional friend, and it turns out we, we don't even live that far from each other. She's in DC, I'm in Virginia, but you know, we we we've done the podcast thing. Today I'm joined by Amanda Milligan. Now, Amanda, I'm super excited. She's the head of marketing at Stacker, Stacker Studio. So what is it? It's a data journalism newswire that you know partners with brands to create and distribute content to their high authority publisher network building brand awareness and earning links for their clients is that did i get did i did i read that properly is, is that the long and the short of it garrett you're like the best person to have described the company outside of like our company <laughs> like that was the best <laughs> way i've ever heard it referred to so yeah well done well you know what i, I will clip that i will send that over and you just put that <laughs> right on the hero of the home page there we go <laughs> <laughs> no but i you know, so you've been in, you've been doing marketing for a hot minute. How, how did you get into marketing in the first place, man? Oh, um, yeah, my degree was in journalism. And then, which actually has tied in really well to my current job. Seriously. Uh, yeah. And really all of marketing, it, like having the writing background and the editing background was really, really key. Uh, and then I heard, like, I didn't want to be a reporter. And I was talking to all my friends who had graduated. And they're like, oh, that was, this was back when social media was like, really taking off and and they were hiring a lot of journalists to do that but at the same time uh penguin and panda happened right um right. and they all these companies were mass hiring really good writers out of school so i got into the agency world that way and have never left since uh, the the content marketing space so it's been a lot of fun I mean, whether, you know, it's agencies or working like with software, it's content is and content has become so much more mainstream these days. Right. Like the whole idea between this like kind of digital ecosystem that we're building, and we'll get into like, you know, the role that news where the content and links play into that. But yeah. you've you've got a mini community. Well, I don't, I don't think a mini community, but a, a group of friends that you you're a big D&D player. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and that just started recently. That really? started in the pandemic. Yeah. My high school friends and I set up a game because I had never really played. And it was such a good way to connect with people remotely. You know, it was it was brutal in 2020. Obviously, that's like the most ridiculous thing to say. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I've just been playing ever since. And like I tweeted one day, like, hey, anybody in the marketing community want to start up? Because like my other games had become like way less frequent. I was kind of like jumped into play more. <laughs> and all these people, a lot of people in the marketing community like to play D&D. So if you ever want to make friends in marketing, just tweet it out. We like literally from a tweet, we formed an entire campaign and it's been I, awesome. I love that. I, I know there's like in local SEO, there's like a whole Mario Kart community. It, who would have thought this is one of those things that you're going to be like, you know, could you imagine five, 10, 20 years ago being like, yeah. So because of a, you know, worldwide plague, I'm playing the game Dungeons and Dragons online with people yep. across the, I mean, where are I actually play, I've been playing uh, Magic the Gathering with my eight year old nephew and he kicks my ass, but it's- I started to get into that and like, I just need more people to play with, you know that, but they, that's all online now too. And it's, it's, it makes it much more accessible and you can play with people everywhere. It's awesome. I'm really it into it. It's not, it was natural. Like, you know, when we, before we had all this stuff, you play the cards, but I'm glad the cards still exist. There's still yeah. that, you know, thing that, that, that physicalness out there. But today we're talking, we're talking about newsworthy content. <laughs> and so, so Stacker, I mean, you've been diving into this whole world. And so I guess my first question is like, let's define it. Like what, what, what do you consider like newsworthy content? What is that? Sure. I mean, just in general, like I said, so I go back to my journalism program <laughs> and I remember like the first thing you learn are like the elements of newsworthiness and some of the most common ones will make very much intuitive sense to anybody who is already writing content, right? So we have recency, another word being timeliness. So I feel like that's what in the marketing realm we say, um, which is more obvious. It's like, yeah, is it happening now? That matters more than something that maybe happened a long time ago um proximity mm. is it happening near you and this is something we will probably talk more about because localization is huge and can really uplift everything that you're doing uh, and then you get into like elements like significance and impact so basically like all these are kind of on a scale right like something right. either happened right now or it happened yesterday but with 
uh, significance. It's like, how impactful was it? If we're thinking about breaking news, was it a traffic jam or did a bridge collapse, right? Those are different levels of impact of significance. And then impact being like, how many people did it affect? So lots of different like elements to look at. And these are just like four off the top of my head. There's, there's others. Novelty is one of those as well. Something that's completely different than no one's ever heard or seen. Um, so the more that you have any of these, the more likely it is that it's relevant, especially to a wide audience. Right. And then, and then obviously you have like the digital components. So like how the, how it becomes newsworthy is, is it spreads that more and more people are interested in it. And so that, that's like the kind of sacred, like goal of this type of content is just getting as many eyeballs on it too. But there, there are other, there are other benefits of creating newsworthy content, I imagine. Oh, absolutely. Like to your point, it's a tactic that is really used when you're trying to reach a wider audience, right? Like, mm -hmm. It's probably not newsworthy anyway if only like two people are affected by it. You might as well just call them on the phone or something. But, uh, it, you know, it's more of a, like a top of the funnel effort because you're building brand awareness, first of all, if you're the one who is the source of this information. So if you're able to create something and then it gets to, you know, dispense or um, <laughs> distributed, that's the word I'm looking for, um, to, a, to a wide audience, then your brand name is being much more well recognized and your authority, because if it's news and you're being reported on by high authority publications that kind of transfers over to you. They're kind of vouching for what you're saying, right? So those are two key things, not even to mention like more of the SEO stuff, which we might dive into. But uh, even just from that level, I think a lot of people, especially on the PR side, understand how impactful that can be to be mentioned in a really respected outlet. Uh, oh, yeah. Just from that alone, yeah, can transfer a lot of authority to your brand. Yeah, I mean, authority matters. When pe when when you are in the news, people are searching for you, and when people are searching for you, they can learn more about you, and that's that's that whole funnel sort of thing. Can you do you have any like examples like last recently? Any recent like newsworthy examples? If you're just like that's it, that's the stuff that I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, some of the stuff that Stacker has done has been super impressive to me. They, I mean, I, obviously, I'm like going to be hugely biased here, but. Um, of they had a couple stories, one that's on the homepage now for anyone who's listening to this um, is like how overturning Roe v. Wade would affect different states. And you don't have to necessarily, I mean, like obviously it's an inherently political topic, but we're all about presenting everything objectively with data, right? Like this is just the reality of the situation and breaking it down by state Kind of brings it home to people reading it like you know on a national level how it could change things but how does it change where you are like in your day-to-day -day life how can that affect what you're doing so not only is this like meet timeliness because it's gonna you know this case is gonna happen this year but also proximity because we're able to localize it and impact because it's gonna affect a lot of people like hits all of those like checks all those boxes right that's cool i, I mean it makes sense like Big things like that impact a lot of people, like political stories, health-related stories, Health, obviously. Yeah. Finance, I, like, it, we oh, deal with this stuff every day. Mm -hmm. Housing market, like yep. any anything, like, and then I can imagine, like, the, the one that comes to my mind recently, which is which is so trivial, but it's been, like, that news story story is Wordle, right? Cause, <laughs> I, cause just, I just hit a 20-day streak, Garrett, and I'm, like, <laughs> so impressed about <laughs> with myself. <laughs> but yeah, no. And that's that's a great example of something that's like you're not going to be the one to break the news that Wordle's a thing, right? <laughs> like, that's just not going to be that doesn't make any sense. But if you take something like that and you kind of want to like jump on something trending, I I like to call it like timely evergreen. Mm -hmm. So it's like which sounds like an oxymoron, but if you're able to create something that's evergreen related to something that's timely, not necessarily directly tied to it. So if you were like they this is God knows that this is a good idea. I'm just coming up with this off the top of my head. But like for Wordle, if you put a piece together that was like, here are all the most like viral games that have come out in the last decade, it could include Wordle, but it's not limited to only right now when Wordle's popular, right? So it's like, how do I take this and contextualize it to be interesting over a long period of time? That's that's a really interesting point. And, and for those of you who are joining us, um, Amanda wrote a great article on Moz, uh, like, a couple of weeks ago, all about that contextualization. Can you can you speak to that a little bit more about like because it, it's not easy to figure right. out how to contextualize something. Like what what sort of frameworks do you use to to think about stories that way? 
Yeah, no, thanks for calling that out. The, the Moz Post, I think, has three questions that are common mm -hmm. to ask. But just really quickly, contextualization, it does exactly what I'm talking about. It's like the timely, uh, evergreen type of approach where you're not breaking news most of the time. So let's think about how do you like add kind of just more more additional viewpoints or perspectives to a story that's already happening or already in development or already, whether it's something like Wordle where it's happening now or something like COVID that's happening over years, like what is a different perspective you can bring? Some of the different things you can ask yourself is like comparisons are kind of, you know, how, what do I compare this to that's similar to this? You know, we see this all the time with COVID comparing it to the early 1900s pandemic, you know, like yeah. people are doing, you see it happen. That's how you know it works. So like comparisons to stuff that's similar or even different, like you see articles about, you know, how people's jobs are affected compared to like other events in history. Like it doesn't have to necessarily be a pandemic. So comparison's a huge one. And then historical context is another one. So, you know, I think not always the, the history of everything does particularly well. You have to have a good angle on it. But if you do, if you're able to be like, especially for something, you know, people don't know about, like mm. you just are convinced that people do not actually have the historical context for something that's happening or you're able to put it more succinctly or in a more interesting way. Context so like can mean all these different things. It's just like putting it in uh, the bigger picture. Like what does this actually mean for us now historically compared to what else is going on? Yeah. It, it, I mean, that's, that's something that I know I struggle with where it's like, you when you are immersed in something like for me you know like it's seo it's like it seems like the type of thing that everyone would know and then you forget that no one's paying attention to any of this stuff and stuff that you think could be common could actually be yeah. a really good angle that just needs you to paint the story for people where it's not necessarily on the radar i know like uh like generations is usually really hot like people love talking about millennials versus boomers boomers versus like gen z yeah. and like context because that's the history point that's right? true that's exactly right that's a great point yeah so then the next point is like is is data backed which i think is kind of a you know is, is it a lost art like basically what role does data backed journalism play in this type of content yeah. And you know, Garrett, that I've been in the, the database content realm for a long time. Yes. Um, but that that's what drew me to Stacker too, because like everything, pretty much everything that do, they do, if it doesn't involve data, it involves like manual research. But mm -hmm. most of the things involve data because two reasons, really. The first is that you're if you're using data in a new way, if you're analyzing it in a new way, that adds a little element of newsworthiness because it is, it's, it's, it's new, even if the data isn't new, you're presenting it in a way that hasn't been presented, right? So that's one thing. The second thing is if you're pitching this, if you're planning to create this and then pitch it to the media or syndicate it to the media, uh, they want to know that they can trust what you're saying. And if it doesn't have evidence quickly, like nobody wants to sit there and vet your stuff when they don't know who you are, you know, especially if you're like manually pitching something like yeah. having data saying like, listen, and this is like stacker stories. You know, we have the methodology right up front. They, all the, the writers say like, this is exactly what we used and how we used it. And it adds just saying that, whether it's the publisher or the reader, a layer of authority. Like, listen, we didn't just make this list up. We didn't make up this analysis. It's based on this specific data set or data sets. And this is how we analyzed it. And you can see that in the Roe v. Wade piece. There was also another piece that, went lo um, that we localized about like, rural hospitals that were shutting down you know and like how that affect local areas all that stuff it's like right up the front here's how we came up with this so i think the credibility part is it's like a fast track for that because otherwise like how is somebody going to know that you're telling like you're, that you're being objectively true about something i know we live it we live in a post-truth sort of uh world too because that's the other thing that journalism is fighting right is is just the you know what what information do you believe and i can imagine when it comes to data some data is more valuable than others like i bet you guys you talk about this in terms of like what is considered oh, yeah. authoritative data out of the gate versus like that might be questionable how do you approach that yeah i know i mean that's an excellent point and that it's been really fun for me to go into a company where there's like half of it's a newsroom mm -hmm. and are very discerning about this type of stuff. And even, and that, this isn't always like, I'm, I'm mentioning kind of more intense news stories as, yeah. in my examples, but even if you're talking about like, we also do like top 100 movies, it, it, like in the right. holiday season, even then 
how are you determining the top 100? What what rankings are you using? And like a lot of the time you see these lists and it's just like some some person's opinion of it, right? They're like, here are the top, like my favorite movies. And they do it because it gets all this engagement, but it's not the most journalistically sound piece in the world. <laughs> you know, even for stuff like that, whether it's like Rotten Tomatoes or IMDb or whatever it is right. that you know has an established way of collecting their data. It's like, you have to do the second step. It's like, okay, here's this data set. How did they get this data? And that's where a lot of people stop. They don't do that part. <laughs> They're not like, oh, cool. It's a data set. I'm just going to use it. You know, our team is like, okay, that looks cool. But where, how, what was their methodology? And you have to understand that in order to feel confident in what you're reporting on. So, um, and I just wanted to make that point that it's not just for like intense news stories. It's right. for like literally anything that you want to do that's data backed. You still have to have a legit source for it. Right. And, and, and another ancillary call out I'll make to that is it also doesn't have like in the SEO world, we, we like you want to like have these studies that are done where you're looking at like millions of web pages. Right. Or like hundreds of thousands of, of words or like, you know, like real estate, you're looking at like every difference. Of, it doesn't always have to be a massive data set. Like to your point about, you know, Rotten Tomatoes or something or like, I mean, I know that actually has a massive data set, but like it can be it, it can be more accessible. I guess, to the average person who does it, who isn't necessarily like a data analyst to begin with, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think, you know, the SEO world is its own. <laughs> that's, <yeah. laughs> it's like, but you know, like there's nothing wrong with case studies or things based on smaller amounts of information, as long as they're positioned the right way. If right. you're doing a story where you're trying, like you're, and you want to be objective and, and really capture what's happening, you know, you just got to make sure you understand that data set and what, and what it's representing. Like, Sometimes the team, you know, I've talked to them, the research team will say like, yeah, we have a data set, but it's missing different states or it's missing different cities. And it's like, you have to be upfront about that. You can't just, you know, <laughs> just gloss over it and, and understanding the limitations of the data you're working with. All of that is extremely important. And the more that you communicate that, the more people will trust what you have to say anyway. Oh, 100%. I mean, that kind of goes, we'll, we'll talk a little bit briefly about a brand authority and like your kind of like the trust that you're building. But before we get there, I'm, I'm curious what research strategies and resources like can a marketer use to develop their kind of like, where can they go to find this stuff that you find is really effective? Yeah, I mean, I think the first step might be obvious, but it's where, where do you want to get covered? Mm, and are yeah. you doing your due diligence to understand what that publisher wants to run so if you go to their site not only are what they're covering what's doing well yeah so what's getting engaged with what's getting shared with the most i mean you can use basumo to you know type a site and see like what is getting shared the most you need to look into that kind of stuff because if you're pitching to a writer or a publisher they care about meeting their objectives which oftentimes have something to do with engaging their own readers right so it's like if you're not doing that first step you're not going to be able to come up with the, the ideas that are going to appeal to the people you're pitching. Right. Um, and we, you know, the team does that. They have, I'm sure like another thing you can do is come up with the, there's data sets out there in your industry already. Right. You need to put all of these into a document and then also add the dates that they're updated. Because if you want to jump on refreshing something you've already done or taking a new approach to something based on like 2022 information, put those alerts in your calendar, you know, <laughs> like, don't just, Oh, I'll figure it out later. Or like, Oh, cool. I'll just remember to do that. You won't. Um, <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, I'll, I'll speak for myself. I wouldn't, Honest. Uh, but you know, it's just having like a, an understanding of like where you're actually trying to get published and like what data you're already working with that like start there. And then I sit in on brainstorms that the, you know, the research and the editorial teams do, and they think in terms of headlines. So they'll say, okay, we understand who we're trying, like the, we talked to our publisher network. We've looked at what has performed, you know, we're, because we're a newswire, we have a lot of historical data of, yeah. oh, we see what stories have been picked up the most. We see what stories have gotten the most impressions. That's all really valuable. So you can do that with your own content. Like what have we pitched that has worked well? What have we pitched that hasn't? And then we think of like, what headlines would captivate me as a reader? And then backtrack. Okay, here's some headlines. Is there data about these things? If there's not, can we get it? Can we like do something to acquire it? If there is, where is it? Is it authoritative? You know, to your point, it's not like a one and done type of process. Right. Um, but that's typically, that, that's like one of the ways they go about it. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, 
it's interesting and it makes sense too because it's like as someone who's trying to get coverage you need to scale as well so it's like you need to look at a variety of different possible publications like without putting your eggs in one basket but to your point there's a lot of proprietary data that you have at your fingertips that you should be ready to capitalize on like that's almost like maybe where you should start right yeah i mean there's people don't often do the analyzing part um it's hard to like sit down and this is all content marketing it's you gotta like really (laughs) take a day and just dig into everything to figure out what has been working and what hasn't but that counts for this too it's like not just what's on your site not just what's ranking but if you're pitching stuff like not just what publication worked well, but what on that publication worked well. And if you don't have enough data for that compared to what else they're publishing, like I said in the first place, like how did this compare to what they've run from other people, like other sources? And did it do well or not? And maybe let's try something different or that killed. Let's take, maybe that methodology could be applied to a different topic or the structure of the, even the headline structure can help inspire a different approach to it. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a big proponent. Like we d- we definitely do that. We like talk to the publishing, you know, the network and say, what do you need? Like, what are you looking for? And if you have that relationship with the publisher, by all means, you know, what, ask them what they would like to see. Uh, that is really invaluable if you have access to it. Oh my God. There, there, there is a science to it. There is experimentation. There is like trying different things out and, and whatever worked isn't always going to work. You know, at some point a, a well runs dry and you need to try new things. And oh, yeah. I, I can imagine getting coverage. There is that credibility part of it that matters in the first place. Like how do you, how do you build that authority? How do you build that credibility with your content? What's important to in your pitch? Oh, in the pitch. Yeah. I mean, the reason why we emphasize data so much is because if somebody doesn't know who you are as a brand, this is a question I've gotten so many times where they're like, well, yeah, if you're Staples or like, a, like just a name that you know, you're yeah. more likely to get coverage, right? I'm like, well, yes and no. Yeah, because they, somebody can immediately think, I know who that is, so I don't have to do like the extra vetting required. But even if you're a brand who people do not know the name of, the content has to speak for itself regardless. Yeah. Um, so the objective approach, the data backed, like the evidence that what you're saying is true needs to be clear in the pitch itself. Um, gotcha. And for us, like, because we syndicate it, we can't take that for granted at all. Like if we send them something and they're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> we lose all of our credibility, you know? Right. It's, that counts for everybody. If you send a bad pitch or you send kind of a story that's like, eh, you know, you're setting yourself up to not be trusted the next time. Yeah. Yeah. And that goes back to those relationships and that, and that's also like when you are producing on the other side, good content, you are establishing brand authority, right? Like how, how do you, how does your content grow your authority among like your readers and potential customers and Mm -hmm. all that? Like what role does that play? Well, content 90% of the time, is something outside of directly selling your product or service. Maybe 95% of the time. Yeah. You're going to have the content that's like really bottom of the funnel. Um, that's great. Uh, you need it. But most content, even bottom of the funnel content, is not solely about the sell. Uh, a lot of it, even for retention, content's about like how to best use this service, how to best use this product. Like let us help you with this process. It's customer service. Like all that type of content is showing that you care about something other than the sale. Yeah. And the way to build authority with people and trust with people is to say, we know about what we offer, but we know also about you. We know about your problems. We know about the industry at large. We're like thought leaders in the whole space. Like we're not just here to make a buck and then we're good. We're we're good. We're done. We're like conversation over. But from the very beginning, if we're able to set that stage of we're not just here solely to get your money content plays a role in every way for that whether i like to talk about this too if you talk about authoritative content on the marketing funnel yeah like just overlay it right because if you talk about testimonials case studies that's like more bottom of the funnel content well people typically don't do more authoritative content at the top of the funnel they don't think it's worth it but that's what newsworthy content is like the key thing at the top of the funnel that if your competitors are all doing bottom of the funnel authoritative content. What's yeah. separating you? Like that extra layer where somebody first hears about you 
and you're in Newsweek and you had something super interesting to say, like you did a really cool report about your industry, that's going to, if there's a deciding factor between two very similar companies, they're going to say, hey, you're doing all this extra stuff in the industry and you know what you're talking about and Newsweek thinks you know what you're talking about. That's a huge authority signal. It, it, it makes so much sense. And, and you really like tap into that idea. Cause I think to myself, anytime I see a well done industry report, I'm like, like, especially if it's in my industry and like a competitor or something, I'm like, damn it. I wish I did that. Like <laughs> that's freaking awesome. Or, or if it's like, you know, ancillary, you like, you look for opportunities to work with other partners. I mean, you all mm-hmm. partner with a ton of organizations to produce that authoritative top of the funnel content. Um, how, how does that process kind of work? Like, what do you guys do in terms of, of building that? Yeah. And something we have to emphasize to our brand partners is we get the final say, because this is not branded content and like in the traditional kind of branded content and it's not sponsored content. Like that's a different thing. If you want to go do that, right. We're not paying publishers to run this. So you have to trust the newsroom at Stacker to say, this is what we're doing We're not trying to sell your product or service. Like this is something authoritative in your space. And this is what we're doing (laughs) because nobody wants to for free run some ad about your brand, right? Like publishers are going to scoff and delete and probably, you know, rage tweet about it because they, they, it's terrible. Like getting those pitches is very annoying. I receive them too for, you know, building. Oh yeah. Um, You know, it's not, it's not the right thing to do. So instead of infuriating journalists who are trying to actually like get good information at the, at the very beginning, you have to be thinking like, what can I offer? That's a value to a wider audience that isn't specifically tied to my brand or service. So that's how we come up with the ideas, but that's what we need brand partners who are on board with that philosophy as well, because if you do it right, it's amazing. Right. But you have to do it right. <laughs> yeah. You have to do it right. And to your point, if you if you mess that up a couple of times, you it's hard to get that back. Now, I want to segue. One thing that's a little tricky is that, you know, tangent of, of syndicated content, because that mm. does kind of run the line of like, it's not necessarily pay to play, but like, how, how do you look at content syndication as a strategy in 2022? Sure. And I have been talking to our head of SEO because I was very curious about this. Yeah. Honestly. Dispel uh, the myths. <laughs> when I joined, because I was like, is it the links or the canonical? So like when you syndicate this content, all these publishers we're syndicating the content to have canonical links or canonical tags that point back to either Stacker because we created this. We also just are a newswire and like a newsroom right. or our brand partners as the original source. And we're thinking that it's actually the canonicals that are driving most of the impact, the SEO impacts, because when a publication decides to republish something in full that you produced, that is a big signal of like vouching for what you have to say. They're not just pulling like your, your report in a link. That's great too. Don't get me wrong. And they still have the link there, but the canonical is also an authority signal. And I think we need to start thinking specifically about links and start thinking about overall authority signals. So just from like, if you're just thinking about it, like without, it's hard to like get out of the SEO because I'm like, thanks. Like like, marketers, that's what they think about. But any time that a third party is basically vouching for what you have to say, and you can extend that to brand mentions, you can extend that to social, you know, engagement, like people talk about this in a brand awareness perspective, all of that are positive authoritative signals to that page. And if you want to, you know, get more out of that, that's where the internal linking comes in. There's more and more people have been talking about internal linking, which is awesome because it's so important. Cool. I'm sure you, yeah, I'm sure you would have like, a, we could do a whole episode on that. Um, but it's, that's how we approach it. Like we tell our brand partners, like, it's not just about getting the links, first of all, right. we get them, but it's also about the trust that a publisher like that has to have in you to republish that. And what somebody, when somebody sees that, yeah, and when Google sees that, what that communicates, right? Uh, well, so- I'm curious in the sense then, so there are probably different levels 
of content syndication. Like when you are oh, yes. evaluating who you're going to be syndicated on, you don't want it to be on a spammy, like, like crappy, you know, blog. It needs to be like a higher level of authority. So, so how do you guys, how do you guys kind of approach that? Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing falls apart if you're syndicating to sites you don't even trust. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like if I'm like, I don't know what this is. I mean, Stacker specifically, we do news. Mm-hmm. Like we right. do news sites. Now, of course, there's other publications out there, but I completely, to your point, you have to be discerning about who you're syndicating to in the same way with link earning, or if you are still link building and you're doing that, you know, you still need to care about where those links are coming from. Uh, we, we look and we, we want to make sure we trust where we're syndicating to because that's going to reflect yeah, well, you. even new, even news, like we were talking earlier briefly politically, but like in a mm. news site, a news site can lean politically one way or the other. And depending on who, who your client is, I can imagine there's, that's part of the, the consideration when like, cause I, I hate to say it, there's just no like down the middle objective news site anymore. Like everyone has a buy. So even, even you guys probably have to evaluate yeah. What is a syndication that, that you or the clients are comfortable with? Yeah, I mean, I think that's in this industry, especially when you're talking about journalism and marketing side by side, yeah. there's always going to be this like healthy tension where you need to be analyzing everything. Like you can't take anything for granted, basically. Like you can't say we're going to take any publisher who meets this criteria. We're not going to work with every client who meets this criteria. To your point, it all has to be taken on like a, case by case basis. And you have to decide you as a company, what are your values? Mm -hmm. You know, what are you trying to achieve? And how are you reflecting that in your tactics? I mean, it's a really interesting point, Garrett. Like it's something that a lot of, I don't think it's common really in companies to sit there and have those tough conversations, but you need to have them. And yeah, like anytime there's an opportunity, it's like, is this reflecting what we're really trying to do here? Like, don't look at the, the results. Don't look at the money. Don't look at the links. Is this who we're trying to be as a right. brand? Because because we're talking about authority and brand credibility, and so it's I guess it's like as a brand you have this like responsibility to pick and choose your associations. Yeah, and I can imagine as you know like a, as like a news partner and helping to kind of get that syndication. That's something that's probably probably you know a good conversation to have. Yeah, I think that's actually really interesting too. I wonder if there is like a like a like a I don't know how, how you would say like like a vetting site in terms of like those types of syndications ensuring that there's alignment. Yeah, I mean, there's so many different levels to look at syndication on. And part of my, like the difficulty of my job yeah. is, you know, because Stacker is a new model of doing this, we're up against preconceived notions of syndicated content. I mean, like yeah. there are, you know, PR syndication wires where you pay and they, it's like sponsored and it's like kind of, a lot of them are low level sites. They just get them. And sometimes people are like, that's fine. That's enough for us. But that's not what we're trying to do. Right. And we're trying to like change the narrative around that when people are so used to it being done in a certain way that it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting challenge for me personally, as I go to, you know, like market this stuff. I'm like, okay, like, there's so many preconceived notions about syndication, about link building. It was just like not even a term I like to use anymore because it sounds too black hat. Like, yep, it's, yeah, it's so interesting to just go against the classic understanding of some of these concepts and syndication. Like to your point, is definitely one of them. Where it's people, cool. I mean, yeah. that that makes the job fun. I remember back when I was doing local SEO, I had the same thing with like reputation. Man- we did online reviews, and it's like reputation management had this this connotation of like when someone does something really crappy like removing it from the web you know and it's yeah. like yeah. you know that that's that's not what it is now you have to change the narrative around something because because to your point I, it sounds like what stacker's doing is really cool with the model um gosh i could talk to you man about all <laughs> this you should you should do like a whole like content syndication like like interview or, or article. Cause I think it is something that needs your kind of clarification on. Um, yeah. That would be dope. If someone wants to find you online as we get to the end here, like where's, where's the best way to keep this conversation going with you? Where, where do you hang out? Sure. Well, I'm definitely on Twitter. Uh, 
at Melanda, M-I-L-L-A-N-D-A. Also, if you go there, you'll see that I'm about to launch a newsletter called nice. Newsworthy. You can sign up through there. Um, you can email me also with my Twitter uh, uh, account. You can see my email, but it's a milligan at stacker.com. And then if you want to hear like about like what I'm talking about with Stacker, which is the brand partnerships, that's studio.stacker.com. But you can see the publication at stacker.com. You'll see like the stories that we do. It's just the, the we're currently working on building a, uh, a site that encompasses our entire story. Uh, oh, cool. But right now, you can go to studio.stacker.com to see how we partner with brands and, and what that looks like. But yeah, I clearly can talk all day. So uh, <laughs> people can tweet me, email me, whatever. And I'm happy to keep talking about this. Awesome. So this no, that's so cool. Yeah, we'll definitely keep our eyes peeled for as you build out like more content on the site and continue to tell your story. Uh, awesome representation, Stacker. Thank you so much for, for joining me today. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Garrett. It's always a pleasure. It was fun. That was fun. Okay, so that's Amanda Milligan of Stacker. My name is Garrett Sussman of IPO Rank, taking a week off, and then we will be back. But keep your eyes peeled. Uh, if you did miss us, the replay will be on the blog tomorrow. Everyone else, have a great rest of your weekend, and we will see you then.